The two major parts of the nervous system are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is all of the structures outside the central nervous system. The sensory receptors, the peripheral nerves, the ganglia, and the motor endings of the efferent nerves. As we look at the overview of the nervous system, here's the central nervous system, but the peripheral nervous system has the sensory division, all of the input, both somatic and visceral, and the motor division, all of the output, again, both somatic and to the autonomic system. The autonomic system will be divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Sensory receptors are specialized to respond to stimuli. These are changes in the environment. Receptors can be classified three ways, by the type of stimulus they respond to, by their location in the body, and by their structural complexity. In terms of stimulus type, we have mechanoreceptors. These are deformed by touch, pressure of any sort, including blood pressure, vibration, and stretch. When any of these things happen, the mechanoreceptors will set up a graded potential. Thermoreceptors are temperature sensitive. Photoreceptors will pick up on changes in light. We find these only in the retina of the eye. Chemoreceptors respond to chemicals in solution. Your sense of smell and taste rely on chemoreceptors, and there are a number of chemicals dissolved in the blood that chemoreceptors check on. Nociceptors respond to painful stimuli. Sensory receptors can also be classified based on their location. Exteroceptors respond to stimuli that come from outside the body. These receptors are located in the skin for touch, pressure, pain, and temperature, and all of your special sense organs are exteroceptors. Interoceptors are sometimes called visceroceptors. These respond to internal stimuli, the stimuli from the organs and the blood vessels. Typically, we do not perceive information that comes through the interoceptors. Proprioceptors are sort of a special class of interoceptor. They're positioned in the joint and pick up movement and joint position. Structurally, sensory receptors are either complex or simple. The complex receptors are the special senses, the eye, the ear, and so forth. Your structurally simple receptors pick up your general senses. These are your tactile sensations of touch, pressure, stretch, and vibration, temperature, pain, and your sense of muscle position and stretch. These are all modified dendritic endings of sensory neurons. Some of these are what we call free nerve endings or non-encapsulated dendrites. Others are encapsulated nerve endings. Non-encapsulated or free nerve endings are very abundant in the epithelial tissue and in your connective tissue. Most of these are non-myelinated nerves, the small diameter group C type of fibers. The distal endings of the dendrites have knob-like swellings on them. They respond mostly to temperature and pain and to light touch and itch. The root hair plexuses are non-encapsulated dendrites. Encapsulated nerve endings are connective tissue capsules around the ends of dendrites. These are all mechanoreceptors. They pick up pressure and touch. Meissner's corpuscles and Pacinian corpuscles are examples of encapsulated nerve endings. There are groups of these nerve endings that are put in special locations. This way you feel pain precisely. You can feel something in your pinky finger, but you don't feel it in your whole hand. Proprioception, things like muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, joint kinesthetic receptors, are also encapsulated nerve endings. Sensation is your awareness of stimuli. This is what you feel. Perception is how you interpret that feeling. Your perception of a stimulus is going to determine how you respond to it. For example, if you have a pebble in your shoe, you sense pressure. That's the sensation. But you feel discomfort. As a result, you're going to act to remove the pebble from your shoe so you no longer feel discomfort. The somatosensory system has three levels of organization. The receptor level, which is what you pick up with your sensory receptors. The circuit level, which are the neurons that ascend up the spinal cord. And then the perceptual level, which is in the cerebral cortex. So as we look at the overview, we have the receptor level, where the receptors pick up information. A first-order sensory neuron will take that to the central nervous system. A second-order sensory neuron will take that up the spinal cord to the thalamus. And then a third-order sensory neuron takes this onto the cerebral cortex so that you can perceive the sensation. A few sensations will go straight to the cerebellum, and some will go to the cerebellum before they go to the thalamus. The ones that go to the cerebellum you typically don't perceive. 
In order to produce a sensation, we have to have two things. We have to have receptors in the area that are specific for that stimulus. Pressure receptors won't pick up temperature changes, for example. And we have to have the stimulus applied in the receptive field for that receptor. The stimulus has to be close enough to the receptor that the receptor picks it up. Once the stimulus is picked up by the receptor, something called transduction occurs. The stimulus energy is converted into a graded potential on the receptor and the dendrites of the receiving nerve. These graded potentials have to reach threshold to generate an action potential. We've got to get threshold to the axon hillock of the first order neuron. If that happens, then this first order neuron is stimulated. This is the neuron that will carry the information to the central nervous system. Sensory receptors will undergo adaptation. Adaptation is a phenomenon where the receptor becomes less sensitive to the stimulus and may even stop responding to the stimulus at all. As the receptor membranes become less responsive, they decline or stop transmitting. Some receptors are phasic receptors. They adapt very quickly. They signal the beginning or the end of a stimulus, but while the stimulus is constantly being applied, you don't particularly pick up on the stimulus. Receptors for pressure, touch, and smell are phasic. You put on clothes in the morning and you feel the pressure of your clothes momentarily, but then you start ignoring that pressure. That's the adaptation of those pressure receptors. Tonic receptors adapt much more slowly if they adapt at all. Nociceptors do not adapt at all. They're the ones that pick up pain, and pain is a signal to your body that something is wrong. Proprioreceptors also adapt either very slowly or not at all. Since these send information about your body position, you don't want your body to not ever know exactly what position you're in. The second level of processing in the somatosensory system is the circuit level. First order sensory neurons conduct the impulses from the receptor to the spinal reflexes or the second order neurons in the central nervous system. Most things that go to spinal reflexes also go on a second order neuron up the spinal cord. The second order sensory neuron is inside the central nervous system. It will trans impulses from the spinal cord up to the thalamus and sometimes to the cerebellum. Those impulses that go to the cerebellum are not perceived. The third order sensory neurons conduct the impulses from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex. Once the stimulus is in the somatosensory cortex, we can perceive the stimulus. The perceptual level of processing occurs in the cerebral cortex. The brain will use projection fibers to send the impulse to several places in the brain. The brain will interpret the stimulus based on the location and the receptor type. Sensory perception is very complex. Usually multiple parts of the brain are involved. Third order neurons will branch and take sensory input to several areas in the cerebral cortex. For example, if you smell something baking, that's going to tickle your olfactory cortex, but you'll start going to memory areas to try to remember exactly what that is you're smelling. And then you'll start remembering the last time you ate it or what it tastes like, and you may begin salivating. So you trigger a whole cascade of perception in your brain. There are several aspects of sensory perception. First of all, you have to detect it. You have to know that a stimulus has occurred. You have to determine how strong the stimulus is. What is its intensity? That's the magnitude of the stimulus. Spatial discrimination allows you to tell where the stimulus is coming from. That is part of the somatosensory mapping on the somatosensory cortex. Feature abstraction is very complex sensations. For example, if you feel velvet, you get several different stimuli. It's warm, it's smooth, it's soft, it's compressible. All of those go into your overall perception of what you are touching. Quality discrimination helps you detect submodalities of a sensation. In other words, you may taste both bitter and salty at the same time when you're tasting something. And then you have pattern recognition. When you're listening to music, you hear words and you hear the melody. You don't just hear individual musical notes. So to review the somatosensory processing, at the receptor level, we pick up the stimulus and if it's strong enough, a first order neuron will take it to the central nervous system. A second order neuron takes it up the spinal cord to the thalamus. Some of them will go to the cerebellum. And then a third order neuron takes it to the somatosensory cortex, and this is where perception occurs, the perceptual level of processing. Pain warns of actual or impending tissue damage. This allows you to take some sort of protective action. 
Several things can stimulate your pain receptors, extreme pressure and temperature, the release of histamine or bradykinin from damaged tissues, the release of potassium or ATP would indicate that cells have ruptured, and acids that could be the byproduct of metabolism can trigger this. Impulses will travel on fibers that release neurotransmitters glutamate and substance P. These are the two neurotransmitters that are most involved in mediating pain. Some pain impulses may be blocked naturally by the body by those endogenous opioids, the endorphins. All people perceive pain at the same stimulus intensity, that's your pain threshold, but pain tolerance varies from individual to individual. If we say someone is sensitive to pain, it means they have a low pain tolerance, not a low pain threshold. Your pain tolerance is somewhat determined by your genetic makeup, as is your response to various pain medications. Long-lasting or intense pain causes hyperalgia, which may lead to chronic pain and phantom limb pain. What happens is this pain goes through the spinal cord and you almost learn a pain reflex. Whenever the pain reflex is triggered, you will feel significant pain. It's crucial to manage pain early and very effectively. Phantom limb pain occurs when you feel a sensation in an amputated limb. Remember, your brain is wired to feel that that particular nerve is bringing information from, say, your big toe. If that nerve is stimulated, your brain still thinks that information is coming from your big toe, even though your big toe is gone. Referred pain is when pain from one area is being perceived as being from a different area. Visceral fibers travel with somatic fibers on nerves. The impulses of visceral fibers typically do not make it to the perceptual level of the brain, so you don't perceive those impulses. However, the visceral fibers that travel with the somatic fibers may irritate the somatic fibers. Those somatic fibers will get to the perceptual level of the brain, making the brain think that that pain is coming from the location of the sensory receptors. Here are some examples of referred pain. The visceral neurons that come from the heart are coupled with sensory neurons that come from the neck and cheek on the left side, as well as the left chest and up the left arm. Pain stimuli from the heart could irritate the neurons from these receptors. This would be translated in the brain as being from these areas, not necessarily from the heart. Gallbladder pain will refer to the right shoulder, pancreas up here to the right neck, and so on. Nerves are bundles of neuronal processes. They're enclosed in connective tissue wrappings. The endoneurium surrounds each individual axon or nerve process. The perineurium will surround bundles of nerves called fascicles, and the epineurium will surround the entire nerve. Just like muscles, the fibers and nerves are arranged in smaller bundles known as fascicles. So this is an entire nerve with the epineurium. We have fascicles or bundles of individual processes. The fascicles are surrounded by perineurium, and each individual process is surrounded by its own endoneurium. This is different from the myelin sheath that would be around the axon. Also, there are blood vessels that go along with the nerves to make sure that the nerves have an adequate blood supply. Most nerves are mixtures of afferent and efferent fibers, both motor and sensory, and they're also mixtures of somatic and autonomic or visceral fibers. They can be classified according to the direction they transmit impulses. Mixed nerves will have both sensory and motor fibers. Impulses on these nerves will travel both to and from the central nervous system. Sensory or afferent nerves have impulses that go only toward the central nervous system. Sensory nerves can be either somatic or autonomic visceral. Motor nerves are efferent nerves. Impulses travel only away from the central nervous system. Again, they can be either somatic or autonomic. Cranial nerves come directly off of the brain and spinal nerves are directly attached to the spinal cord. Ganglia are neuron cell bodies that are found in the peripheral nervous system. These were called nuclei in the central nervous system. The dorsal root ganglia are the cell bodies of sensory neurons. The efferent cell bodies and ganglia of the autonomic nervous system are motor neurons, and it's only in the autonomic nervous system that we have motor ganglia. If a nerve is damaged near or at the cell body, the neuron can die. Also, any of the neurons that are exclusively stimulated by the dead neuron may also die. Axons in the peripheral nervous system may regenerate if the cell body of the neuron is still intact. 
peripheral nervous system axons can regenerate if the damage is not too severe. The axon at the point of injury will swell and seal off, and then you will have Wallerian degeneration. The axon will degenerate distally from the point of injury down to the end of the axon. Macrophages will come into the area and clean up all the dead axon debris, and Schwann cells will be stimulated to divide. The axon filament will grow through the new regeneration tube made by the dividing Schwann cells. The axon will then regenerate, growing along the regeneration tube, and the new myelin sheath will form. But this is a very slow process. Axons only grow about one and a half millimeters a day. If the nerve is damaged, we'll have the swelling and the sealing off, macrophages will come in and clean up the debris, and the Schwann cells will be stimulated to divide. As the Schwann cells prepare the regeneration tube, the axon will begin to regrow, and eventually we'll have a new axon with a new myelin sheath. Most central nervous system fibers do not regenerate for several reasons. In the central nervous system, the oligodendrocytes have growth inhibiting proteins on them to prevent central nervous system fiber regeneration. This is somewhat protective. We don't want a lot of new neurons forming in the brain randomly. The astrocytes are the cleanup crew in the brain. They work a little slowly, so they don't come in and clean up as quickly, and scar tissue tends to form. And finally, the oligodendrocytes, when they're damaged, tend to die, so there's no regeneration tube. There's no direction for the new axon to grow. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Some are primarily sensory, some are primarily motor, and some are mixed. They emerge from the brain and serve the head and neck with the exception of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve leaves the head and neck area and travels to the internal organs of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. The cranial nerves have a name and a Roman numeral. Cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. This is a sensory nerve because it's your sense of smell. Cranial nerve number two is also a sensory nerve. This is your optic nerve and this is your sense of vision. Cranial nerve number three is the oculomotor. Now it tells you it's a motor nerve and it also tells you what it moves. This is for eye movement. The trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four, is a motor nerve also involved in eye movement. Cranial nerve 5 is the trigeminal nerve. This is a large nerve that covers a lot of your face, and it's a mixed nerve. It's involved in facial sensation, that would be the sensory part, in operating your chewing muscles, so that would be the motor part. It has three large nerve branches, and this is the largest of the cranial nerves. Cranial nerve 6 is the abducens, which is a motor nerve. About the only thing you can abduct in your face is your eye. Cranial nerve number seven is your facial nerve. This is another mixed nerve. It helps with facial expression, so that's the motor part, and taste would be the sensory part. Your vestibulocochlear nerve is primarily sensory. Your sense of hearing and equilibrium is handled by this nerve. Cranial nerve nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is also a mixed nerve, controlling muscles that help you swallow and helping you with your sense of taste. The vagus nerve is a mixed nerve. This is the only one that leaves the head and neck region. It goes down to the abdominal and thoracic viscera. Cranial nerve number 11 is the accessory nerve. It's also a motor nerve. Sometimes it's called the spinal accessory. This controls the neck muscles, the larynx, and the pharynx, so it's involved in swallowing. And cranial nerve number 12 is the hypoglossal nerve, which is a motor nerve. This one is involved in tongue movement.